So uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers very much for, for organizing this, this conference in such a beautiful place. It's been really great to be here for a little bit of time and have had some really good discussions with people. So it's been very nice to be here, Stephanie. OK, so uh, this is the final talk of the day, and I think possibly the final talk of the conference on AmbiTwister strings. So you'll all be relieved that we can move on and talk about something more sensible quite soon. However, <coughs> uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to start with just a very brief review of the basic AmbiTwister string model. Of course, we've already had very nice, very nice discussions of this already from, in particular, uh, Lionel and Ricardo. So I'll perhaps be, be rather brief, but I'll emphasize and highlight the, the things that are going to be important for the development of my story, which is when we're going to go and put AmbiTwister strings on a more general curved background. Okay. So this was work I did a few years ago with uh, Eduardo Casale and Tim Adamo. And, and then we'll specialize to the case of anti sitter space for simplicity, ADS3, cross S3, cross some flat four manifold. And um, this is sort of still work in progress with uh, Kai Rurig. Unfortunately, Kai Rurig is now earning lots of money in some bank, and so the progress is slower than I'd like it to be. <coughs> okay. Okay, so as we've heard, AmbiTwister strings are chiral theories on a world sheet, and the basic action is just a first order action where everything in sight is, is left moving. So I'm going to talk just exclusively, first of all, in this talk, I'm going to be exclusively at genus zero, and I'm largely just going to talk about the, the so called type two AmbiTwister string, which I think is the one that's best understood, where in addition to a basic PX system, first order PX system, there are two systems of fermions, just like in the type 2 RNS strings, except here they're both left moving. Okay? And or, um, X is a scalar field, and everything else, the conformal weight is, is uniquely fixed by the requirement that, that action makes sense. So P's got holomorphic conformal weight 1 on the world sheet, and both sides have holomorphic conformal weight a half. Okay, so on its own, that would be trivial, but it has a few gauge symmetries, which we gauge with the BRST operator. So as usual, there's just the standard stress tensor with its, its usual ghosts. But then there are three other currents, one bosic, bosonic and two fermionic currents. H is P squared, and these fermionic currents are P dot psi. And of course, <coughs> these things look, if, if you thought that P was dx, of course, that would just be the normal supercurrent in the RNS string, but P here isn't related to X. P is just its own field. And so this isn't really a supercurrent. Rather, these, these things obey a, a well sheet algebra, which turns out to be SL1 slash 1, whose, whose relations uh, are these. And in particular, this algebra has got nothing at all to do with the stress tensor. So it's got nothing at all to do with well sheet diffeomorphisms. And for this model, the, B, uh, the BRST operator is, is, is nilpotent provided d equals 10, this constraint coming as usual just from the stress tensor, including the ghost contribution. We don't gauge that, no. Uh, I've looked. It hasn't given me anything interesting particularly. I should say there's also... It won't change it that much. Um, I, 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 sorry? Yeah, yeah it, look, it, it certainly looks very similar. Uh, but again, remember that, that, that it, it's not an n equals 2 string in the sense that this is not world sheet super symmetric. Rather, it's a sort of super, super gauge theory on a world sheet in some sense. Um, the gauge theory with the supergroup. There's also, there's also a sort of obvious Z2 cross Z2 subgroup of that U1, which acts individually on Psi1, Psi2, and we do gauge that, i.e. there is a GSO projection. Further questions on this? <coughs> so it's a quadratic differential. So, so like the stress tensor, it's got conformal weight 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so P here is P subscript Z, if you want. And then so H is P is H subscript ZZ. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's got the same tr behavior under conformal transformations as T. It, it's primary rather than quasi-primary. 
So with those fields, the simplest vertex operators you can write down um, just look like this. So they've got both the ghosts, they've got both uh, the fermionic ghosts, delta functions in, in the fermionic ghosts. We could write them in a bosonized way if you like. Two of the fermions, some polarization tensor and a plane wave. <clears throat> of course, these are similar to those to the standard vertex operators that you get in, in the RNS string. But here, all the fields are left moving or holomorphic. So everything has got, at most, holomorphic conformal weight. And an even more important difference is because the XXOP is trivial, the kinetic term was just P d bar x, so the XXOP itself is trivial, this plane wave has got no anomalous conformal weight. There's no normal ordering issues in e to the ik dot x. So it's got vanishing conformal weight, whatever you choose for k squared. To put it another way, there's no, um, the, the, the mesh shell condition for the vertex operators has got nothing to do with the world sheet stress tensor, unlike in normal string theory. Instead, the condition that k squared actually has to be zero, together with these transversality conditions, the polarization tensor, come from OPEs between these other currents that we're gauging. So there's obviously a double pole with p squared and that vertex operator, which is proportional to k squared. And so that's where the field equation comes from. Okay. So precisely because it's come from here rather than the stress tensor, there is no choice. k squared just has to be zero. There are no massive states in the spectrum. After GSO projections on each of the two fermions, and also including the Raman sectors for each of the two fermions, the complete spectrum is just that of type 2 supergravity in 10 dimensions, A or B, depending on how you choose the, the chiralities of the target space spinners in the Raman sector. Now, as we've heard, the claimed fame of this theory is that it provides the sort of theoretical background to the CHY formulae for amplitudes. They, 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 this theory was, if you like, constructed so as to be a world sheet model which, which, which underpins CHY. Okay. So <clears throat> with n vertex operators, I showed you the gauge fixed action, but really the, the, the gauge field um, conjugate to the current P squared has some moduli. It's like a Beltrami differential, so it has n minus 3 moduli. Where, where these Beltrami, these mu a's are just Beltrami differentials on the world sheet together with these insertions of the vertex operators. And they come as usual with some arbitrary coefficients and we're supposed to integrate over these arbitrary coefficients as part of the path integral perspective. If you like, that's all that's left of the integral over the world sheet gauge field, the bosonic part of the world sheet gauge field. Okay. So, <clears throat> Um, the, the standard coupling of the gauge field to, to its currents with the gauge field restricted just to be its moduli looks like that. And now, uh, as has been said, if each vertex operator is just proportional to a plane wave, you can integrate out x completely, and that constrains p at genus zero. p had to be always holomorphic except at the insertion points of, of vertex operators, and at genus zero, that constrains it to have um, that form there. It's important that we, we chose not just solutions to the free, free field equations, but plane waves, so as to be able to have that trick of integrating out x and finding an explicit form for p. And then the standard choice for what these Beltrami differentials are is you just say, well, it just extracts the residue of the quadratic differential. It multiplies at one of the mark points for your choice of n minus three mark points. And so if we extract this at the i-th mark point, we get these scattering equations. Okay, so this integral of mu against p squared just becomes uh, this factor, and doing the integral over the moduli, sorry, there's an EA missing from, from inside here, doing an integral over this moduli then gives us a delta function with an with a optimistic choice of contour for that integration. More honestly, you, you, you have to evaluate it by some sort of Morse theory contour argument, which was done by Omori, and indeed, the answer does indeed turn out to be this delta function. And the point, of view, the point is that these scattering equations, we've got fixed external momenta, but we still have to do our integral over the, over the world sheet insertion points. But we've got n minus three of these scattering equations, and they completely freeze the world sheet insertion points, the locations of the vertex operators, in terms of the external momenta. 
That's consistent with the fact that these ambitwister strings are just a field theory. The, the spectrum was just that of, of supergravity, nothing else. We don't expect field theory amplitudes to involve gamma functions or, or more complicated objects. They should be much simpler than in, in string theory. I'll also remark that whilst each scattering equation fixes the mark points in terms of the, the ki, of course, these are rather high degree, if we clear the denominators, these will give us rather high degree uh, equations. And so solution by solution, the mark points will be given in terms of some complicated algebraic function of the, of the momenta. But when you sum over all solutions, that algebraic function collapses down to a rational function, as we know that the Feynman amplitude at tree level must be in terms of the external momenta and polarization data. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the geometry associated to, to what those gauging currents means, which was what Lionel was explaining this morning, you can see that the theory does indeed live on this ambitwister space, the space of light rays, even in the presence of vertex operators. And the world sheet correlation function gives us exactly the gravitational amplitude in the form of the CH1 form, where these, these Fafians, I won't go through the details, but the Fafians come from evaluating the correlation functions of the fermions or the, the polarization data sitting in the vertex operators. And the Jacobian involves from just solving the solutions to the scattering equations in the delta functions. <clears throat> the type two model that I've, I've mentioned so far is, is the sort of best understood one. However, for example, there, there are variants. Um, for example, if we replace one set of those fermions by some more general current algebra, like in the heterotic string, but keep everything left moving, then we get a sort of heterotic version which describes yang mills coupled to, unfortunately, a higher derivative gravity. Um, <clears throat> we could instead include more well cheap fermions, and we can get other theories like born infeld theory or a particular version of the Galileon theory like that. There's a whole zoo of these things that exist depending on how, how insistent on cancellation of world sheet anomalies and things you are. But the, the type 2 one that I'm going to talk about today cancels all anomalies. Okay. Now, let's put this, this, um, <clears throat> let's put this type 2 string on a curved background. So the basic action that we had before was just P D bar X and then fermion D bar fermion. Here, I suppose I've complexified my fermions uh, into psi 1 plus I psi 2 and psi 1 minus I psi 2. This thing was completely geometric. It involved no metric at all. And so uh, it makes sense already on a curved background. But the fermion term, since the fermions are fluctuations, they should involve uh, the covariant derivative, so the pullback of the covariant derivative on the target space. However, we can always, if we like, since this covariant derivative comes with a piece proportional to d bar x, when we pull it back, we can always shift the field p to a new field pi so as to absorb that, that uh, connection term, the leverage vita term, in terms of, of pi. If we do this, then we're working non-covariantly with the fermions, but we have the advantage of a free world sheet action. Standard trick. Now, the action wasn't the, the whole thing. We also needed to know what currents we were gauging in the BRST operator. And again, largely they follow pretty much straightforwardly from, from just trying to write down covariantizations of the, of the previous currents. So before we had psi dot p, this becomes psi dot pi. We had psi tilde dot p, which becomes that. And we had p squared, which is sort of uh, g pi pi. This is obviously some sort of covariant form of the, I don't know, Bocknell Laplacian or something like that. <clears throat> so these terms here are more or less what you find just from classical Poisson brackets of the, of the curved space currents. And it, by Poisson brackets, they close into the same well sheet SL1 slash 1 algebra as before. However, you need to add derivative corrections, which I've explicitly written down for the two fermionic currents and left implicit precisely because it's horrible for the, uh, <clears throat> for, for the bosonic current. And these, these derivative terms ensure that these composite operators transform properly under, under target space diffeomorphisms. So normally curved beta gamma systems are rather delicate. They have rather delicate properties with, with respect to target space diffeomorphisms, as you can see, because you know, you'll get determinants of d-bar operators. They're chiral. They're typically anomalous under, under uh, and uh, target space coordinate transformations or gauge transformations in general. So, so yeah, you can think of these as being normal ordering. 
precisely. There's, there's no there's no psi x op. There's um, there's a psi psi tilde op, which is part of this normal ordering story here. Yeah, so, so they, they are free of normal ordering activities. And, and it works much nicer than normally in string theory precisely because the XXOP is trivial. Okay. I'm sorry? Good. So, so classically, by Poisson brackets, yes for these. Uh... So there's an obvious U1, which we're not gauging, but was referred to before. So it's a global U1, I suppose. This has charge 1. This has charge minus 1. What do you mean by physical? It's not gauged. At the moment, I mean, yes. The states are actually uncharged with respect to that symmetry. I think that's related to the GSO projection. That Z2 cross Z2 will... will it, it, it's strong enough to impose that, I think. I think that's right. Okay, so I, as I said, classically, the Poisson brackets of these, of these currents obey the same algebra as they did in the flat space model. However, here's where we, we sort of, we, we steal a march on, on normal strings. Here's where we see that this is a simpler theory than normal string theory. You see, the fact that you know that for n particles, any number of particles, the flat space amplitudes are precisely the supergravity amplitudes, you immediately know that the exact consistency conditions for this theory on, on a curved space must just be the super, the super gravity field equations, the Einstein equations. Okay? Because if there was anything else, if there was any higher order curvature term sitting in the target space effective action, it would have shown up in some tree-level amplitude for sufficiently high particles, sufficiently high number of particles, and it didn't, because we got all the right amplitudes. Okay, so since that has to be the exact consistency conditions on a curved background, we ought to be able to compute it exactly and see that it really is the consistency conditions on a curved background. But where should that come from? Well, the fact that the linearized field equations, the mass shell condition, didn't come from the world sheet stress tensor OP, rather it came from the P squared, the OP with P squared, one of these currents, that suggests that this, these Einstein equations should really arise as an anomaly for this world sheet SL1 slash 1 current algebra rather than from anything to do with the world sheet beta function. <clears throat> so that's true. So now if we compute the, um, the OPEs, the full OPEs, which we can compute because we've just got a free world sheet theory between those composite currents, then find that you get the right algebra between the fermionic currents, just provided R obeys the standard Bianchi identities, whereas G and G tilde, which you'd like if it's just SL1 plus 1, just to be the simple pole term here, actually has some higher order pole terms. Um, and the coefficients of these higher order pole terms you recognize as the Dilaton, Einstein, and B-field equations, so just the, the never short sector of the supergravity equations. Okay, so if you want those, if you want the, the, the same well sheet SL1 slash 1 algebra to be anomaly free on a curved background, you need your background to be a solution to supergravity. And of course, I'm doing the, the sort of RNS version, so I need it to be an RNS solution. Now, you'd hope that these theories, even on a curved background, are much simpler than they are for string theory, precisely because the XXOP still remains trivial. Okay. So, in particular, it's possible to write down arbitrary vertex operators, at least in the fixed picture, um, on an arbitrary background, and uh, even compute some amplitudes in, in certain specific backgrounds. This has been done by uh, Eduardo and Lionel and collaborators. Um. <clears throat> And it's possible to write down these vertex operators, again, just because you don't need to worry about normal ordering between the metric and itself, the target space curve metric in itself, because XX has no OP. So what would we like to do with them? 
Well, an obvious goal, although I'm afraid to say an unrealized goal, is to try to understand a sort of <clears throat> ambitwister string on anti sitter space with the aim of obtaining what you might call a CHY formula for tree-level supergravity in ADS, so a resummation of all endpoint supergravity Witten diagrams in terms of some sort of scattering equation type objects, solutions of some sort of ADS version of the scattering equations, that does for Witten diagrams what CHY does for Feynman diagrams in flat space, even at tree level, even for just supergravity. These are, of course, the natural analog in, in ADS of, of, of normal scattering amplitudes. The external legs here are all on shell, just like in a scattering amplitude. And it seems to be worthwhile. I mean, for endpoint such uh, correlation functions, much, much less is known. It's known already about flat space endpoint amplitudes. So, so it's kind of really new territory here. That's my hope. As I say, I'm, I'm not going get, to get there. OK, so let's start from the simplest place. <clears throat> let's start from ADS3 cross S3. That's simple precisely because it's a group manifold, of course. And um, so that's a solution. Well, so, so, so uh, OK, I, I, I'm, I'm going to put it at the sort of pure another Schwartz point of its moduli space where the flux in, in, the, in the ADS3 and the S3 is, is just <clears throat> the never Schwartz 3 form. And because it's a group manifold, we can adapt the ambitwister string to that. So instead of PDX, I'm going to have a sort of West Amino Witten like term. Instead of D bar X, I've got G inverse D bar G. And instead of P, I've got J. And once again, J is just its own field. It's got nothing to do with the derivative of G. And again, I've got some, uh, I've got a pair of fermions. Sorry, I've used bad notation here. So, so Psi and Psi Twiddle are now both real fermions on the world sheet, or, or um, they're not complex conjugates of each other, at least. <clears throat> okay, with the usual sort of group covariant derivatives and some choice of uh, a bi-invariant metric on this product of groups. So if the group was semi-simple, if we just had one factor, that would have to be the killing form, but it isn't semi-simple, and so it doesn't have to be the killing form. M, A, B is symmetric, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a metric on, on the product of groups. I'll, I'll say explicitly what it is later, but it's, it's the standard thing that you know. Um, you will see it in the... So, so, so you could ask the same about any curved space model. It never appears in the action. It appears in the currents that we gauge. You can compute the OP. For, I, sh I should mention that this, is, this theory is actually conformally invariant without a, a WZW term. There's no need to include it. Well, it's actually incorrect to include any sort of WZW term, as you might expect from the fact that G appears only, only with holomorphic deriv anti holomorphic derivatives. And um, <clears throat> you can compute the OPs, for example, by the standard ward identities between the various fields. And you find these results, which are, which are more or less what you'd expect. Again, let me emphasize that the, the, the OP between G and itself is trivial. And um, perhaps let me also emphasize that the level in the JJ OP is zero. Uh, that's certainly true. It, it, in fact, as always in the ambitwister string, I, I guess I'm lying slightly. It's really, it's really SL2C cross SL2C. It's the complexification of, of that group that we're looking at, as it has to be because it's holomorphic. But, but then certainly pi 1 is 0. And I think pi 2 is probably also 0, which is more relevant because... It's holomorphic maps. OK, so to promote that basic model to an ambitwister string, again, we have to gauge our currents, like the flat space p squared, p dot psi, and, and p dot psi twiddle. And we find that these are the right currents. So again, there's some sort of obvious covariant Laplacian on the group, and some sort of covariant analog of, of, of the two currents, of the, of the um, the currents involving the fermions. 
These things are completely free of normal ordering ambiguity. So individual terms here, for example, this term, there is an OP between J and Psi tilde. So that thing individually, if you point split it and, and regularize it in some way, it'll depend on the regularization. But the whole thing, there's no ambiguity. There's a, there's a unique operator, unique meaning to what those things can be. And if you compute the, the OPs between these, then again, it's very nearly just it's very nearly just the SL1 slash 1 algebra that you expect, but there's this higher order anomaly term involving the contraction between the, the choice of metric that you made in the kinetic term and the killing form on the group. But of course, that's just the Einstein equations. Because we're on a group manifold, the Ricci tensor is just proportional to the killing form. Um, Nathan's question, the, the three form flux is again proportional to the structure constants of the group, and the dilaton is constant. And then with those choices, the Einstein equation and the B-field equation are just automatic. However, the Dilaton equation isn't automatic. The Dilaton equation precisely becomes the fact that the killing form should be traceless with respect to this metric. And that works because we've got a semi-simple, as I said, of course, on a semi-simple group, this, this wouldn't work because this would have to be the killing form. But because we're on a product group, it doesn't have to be the killing form. And the, the killing form on the product group, if we use sort of SO4 notation, is just, uh, is just the difference between two, two metrics where, where these indices on the group, I'm, I'm writing as an anti-symmetric pair of indices here. Whereas you can choose a bi-invariant metric, which is the four index epsilon symbol, again, in the same SO4 notation. Once again, the central charge vanishes. So, so although the world sheet SL1 slash 1 algebra is, is completely anomaly free, the BRST operator receives a contribution squared, receives a contribution from the central charge. It also involves the stress tensor. And that still vanishes if and only if D is 10. So we need to couple just as, as normal to some sort of flat internal four manifold. I'm not going to talk about those states in this talk. Now again, rather remarkably, we can write down explicit expressions for all the vertex operators. And they're completely trivial. They're exactly what you'd want them to be. They're just of exactly the same form as they were in the, the flat space model, where V is now some function on the group. And um, <clears throat> uh, the, con the conditions that that be B or ST closed are precisely those three equations up there, written in terms of some derivatives. So the, the first two are uh, some sort of transversality conditions. Well, they're exactly the transversality conditions. And the second one is some combination of that and the field equations. And to tease them all out, if you, if you separate VAB, which has no particular symmetry, into its symmetric, anti-symmetric, and M trace part, there's a little bit of M trace hiding in, in, in my definition of GAB, you can see that those, those three equations precisely uh, decompose into linearized solutions for a graviton, B field, and dilaton, linearized around this ADS background. In particular, if you choose uh, VAB to be of, of this form, where the only dependence on the ADS point here is, is, in, is in G, H here is some boundary, boundary point. Likewise, here, um, the only dependence on, on the field is, is, is in the denominator here. These things are indeed, firstly, you should recognize them as, as belt to boundary propagators with some polarization corresponding to the fact that they correspond to holomorphic stress and, and anti holomorphic stress tensors on, on the boundary of ADS3. But again, these have such a nice form precisely because the GGOP is trivial. So you can check that these things are indeed in the BRST cohomology. They do, at the quantum level, they are Q-closed. Once again, you'd expect correlation functions to be much simpler because precisely because even though you've got non-polynomial dependence on, on the coordinates of ADS, there is no OP between the coordinates of ADS. So except for the scattering equations, the, the, the non-trivial part always comes from, from the OPs between the, uh, the fields J and the fermions with the, <coughs> um, uh, with the ADS story. So except for the scattering equations, which I'll talk about in a minute, you can always integrate out J quite straightforwardly. So it's OP with any one of these, these vertex operators, or the G-dependent part of the vertex operator. We can always trade that. Of course, this just generates right translations on the group. Um, and we can always trade that for an action of the group on the boundary point instead. So if I parameterize, so H had to be a, a, 
um, if it was on the boundary of ADS3, it was some, some two by two matrix of determinant zero, which I can think of as, as, as like that. And then these three derivatives, you can, they act explicitly on this boundary coordinate X in this way, where these three just generate SL2 acting on the boundary, the boundary conformal group. Delta is the conformal weight on the boundary. You again get some Fafians, and they, they generalize the flat space Fafians in more or less a straightforward way. So whereas in the flat space Fafian, you had factors like epsilon dot k, epsilon dot one of the momenta, that gets generalized to a sort of polarization tensor, which on the group is, is, is defined this way, dotted into one of these derivative operators here acting on the j. So, so my dot here is the sum over the, over the SL2 indices, and the i and j are particle indices. And these derivatives act on the product of the, of the wave function sitting to the right. Just as a small sanity check, we can compute explicitly the two-point and the three-point correlation functions of, of, of these vertex operators, and you get exactly the right answers for, for two- and three-point correlation functions of, of various combinations of boundary stress tensors. But of course you did. They're fixed by symmetry. There's no big surprise there. Just as a, a small sanity check. Of course, the real challenge is to understand what can be the ADS scattering equations, and they only arise when you've got more than three particles. So... <clears throat> The, the, the key thing was to understand the action of this sort of group space Laplacian. The well sheet gauge field has got exactly the same moduli as before. It's got exactly the same well sheet conformal weight as before. So the only remnant of, of, the, of the well sheet gauge field is again in the same position as before. Before we would have had P squared here. Now, before, remember, if we were scattering plane waves in, in, in position space, if we were sc scattering momentum eigenstates, then we turned P squared into just some function of the external momentum, Ki dot Kj, just some Mandelstam variable. We can't really do that here because you know, this, this, um, th this is some operator we're acting on belt to boundary propagators. Instead, it gets turned into this differential operator. Again, these are the same boundary differential operators, generators of the boundary SL2 that I wrote down before. And this thing is taken to act on the rest of the correlation function. So again, on the, all the G part of the, of the uh, wave functions. But we're optimistic that the, the integral over the moduli space should somehow still localize because we know, again, it's a field theory. We're not expecting it to be some incredibly complicated string theory answer. Okay, so all the essential ingredients you can see in an in a anomalous but simpler model, which, is, um, which has the same sort of structure of some sort of map to, to ADS together with a, a gauging of P squared or J squared, gauging of the Laplacian, and throwing in some, some world sheet current algebra. So this is one of these sort of slightly less well-defined uh, ambitwister strings in quotes before that I mentioned before. And the vertex operators here, for example, look like that. <clears throat> and for, if, if we want this to describe a scalar uh, belt-to-boundary propagator, then we choose this function to be that, and this would be a massless scalar in, in um, ADS3. If we're studying this around flat space, then as I think Lionel and, and, and perhaps Ricardo mentioned, uh, the amplitudes you get just look like a bunch of well sheet park taylor factors together with the Jacobian summed over all solutions to the scattering equation, and they correspond to this bi-adjoint scalar theory. So it's, it's some, some space-time scalar that's in the adjoint of, of G cross G tilde, two copies of a group. Sorry, the tilde should be there. <clears throat> okay, and it has a cubic interaction. However, this world sheet theory isn't just a theory of this bi-adjoint scalar. It also contains, as you'd expect, it contains uh, a gauge field, the gluons that, that, that gauge each of these, these groups, and it also contains some sort of spin two particle, but both of these things are, are slightly badly behaved. They're higher derivative. So I, I don't wish to take this particularly seriously as a, as a theory. However, if we just extract the double leading color trace parts of it, then these double leading, by which I mean single trace in, in G, single trace in G tilde, those terms don't contain, if you just try to construct Feynman diagrams, they don't contain any internal diagrams which, which have any of these badly behaved states flowing. 
Okay, so what would happen to that amplitude? What would we get if we tried to do the same thing in ADS? Well, the part Taylor factors will do exactly what they did before, and we'll be left with uh, moduli that are supposed to somehow give scattering equations acting on these wave functions. Okay, and again, we integrate out J squared and turn it into these derivative operators with respect to the boundaries. Now, once you've got rid of J squared in favor of these boundary derivatives, the only other place it appears is in the action, and it just tells us that G, it constrains G to be a holomorphic map. But if G is holomorphic over a Riemann sphere, it has to be constant. And so this integral just immediately reduces to an integral over ADS, just a contact interaction over ADS, single copy of ADS. And these are well known. These are the D functions of, for example, Doka, Friedman, and, and Rastelli. So for, um, I think, four points in D equals two, there's some sort of dialogue. <coughs> but the problem is, this isn't really the right place to look for any sort of scattering equations. The, 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 the actual correlation function, if this is going to be some complicated transcendental function, they're not likely to play very nicely with uh, solutions of the scattering equations. So, so what worked well in flat space is that the Fafians and um, all the part Taylor factors were rational functions of the polarization data and the momentum. And then when we summed this over all solutions to the rational scattering equations, we again got a rational answer, as we knew we had to for, for, uh, <coughs> for flat space tree-level Feynman diagrams. Here, if the amplitude is, if the correlation function is already some transcendental function, and I sum over solutions to, to algebraic scattering equations, I have no idea what the properties of the resulting function will be. It certainly doesn't seem very nice. So there's a nice idea, which is that the, we should be looking at this in Mellin space. If we take the Mellin transform of this D function that we had before, then in Mellin space, it looks like this. There's some normalization factor. All the dependence on the, on the boundary points here goes into this, this, uh, this power of xij. And then there are some gamma functions. We integrate over these, these Mellin parameters delta, which are constrained to sum to the conformal weights of, of the, the, the states taking part. So <clears throat> the D function, or that contact interaction in ADS, really is, is represented just by this, this so-called Mellon kernel. And because it's a contact interaction in ADS, you should think of this as the analog of just a, a momentum space delta function for flat space. Now, more generally, if you're talking about any scalar Witten diagram, then these people showed in, in a series of very nice papers that you can build up in Mellon space a rather nice Feynman diagram prescription for how to build up these more complicated amplitudes. So they always multiply this Mellon kernel, the analog of the, del the momentum delta function, and instead we get some rational Mellon amplitudes, the rational function of these, of these delta ij's. So for example, for this, this single exchange diagram, the yeah, for, for massless particles in, in 2D, if, if delta equals D, then it, it's rational. But yeah, I agree. Normally, you get some horrible hypergeometric things, but they all truncate if you, if you choose appropriate states. <clears throat> yeah, so for example, in, 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 um, in D dimensions, this single exchange diagram of massless scalars will, will give you a, a diagram like that. Okay, so the fact that the Mellon amplitude is rational is encouraging. That's, that's sort of what we want from our, our scattering equations. So <clears throat> what I hope happens, and, and what I've been unable to show so far, is that so, so, so what we should do is we have to work out what's going to happen, how this, this differential operator acts on the Mellon kernel. So before it would have just given some Mandelstam ki dot kj. Here, I'm not so sure what it gives. Then the idea is that integrating over these moduli again give us some, some delta functions localizing on solutions to whatever that is. And then we just evaluate um, those delta functions. We evaluate the well sheet uh, insertion point integral by, by saturating those delta functions. So <clears throat> this thing is sort of the bilocal part of the, of the group Laplacian, the SL2 quadratic Casimir. Acting on that Mellon kernel, it's, it gives this, and you can check it has all the right properties. Indeed, so it was important for this thing to have no double poles, that if I took just the, you know, to have no pole at infinity, for example, that if I took uh, just the numerator and I summed over all particles apart from, apart from one, it gave zero, analogous to this in flat space, and indeed that's true of this expression. <clears throat> 
for the same reasons, actually. What is what, sorry? Oh, delta is the conformal, so, so everything is a massless scalar, so, so here it's two, actually. We can also insert the current that we're gauging explicitly in the, in the, in the path integral. That gives us some sort of ward identity. And the ward identity we find, I, I perhaps won't explain it, but it's a known thing. It's, it's exactly this sort of functional equation of, of, of these sort of, that's been found before in, by, by these Mellon experts, which relates uh, a Mellon amplitude and certain shifted Mellon amplitudes where we shift the values of the deltas that appear already in these Mellon amplitudes to a Mellon amplitude where one of the, one of the propagator legs is, is, is contracted. So a cancelled propagator argument, if you wish. That emerges as a ward identity for us. However, I haven't been able to work out what the value of the exponential of this operator acting on, opting on that is. Probably the right thing to do is to expand that Mellon kernel in terms of conformal blocks, the eigenfunctions of this operator. But that's, as I say, work in progress. Or, or maybe I'm just being silly. Okay, so I'll stop there. Um, so, <clears throat> as, as I've said, type 2 ambi twister strings describe supergravity, purely supergravity in, in 10 dimensions. In flat space, the well sheet correlation functions, as we've had several times, give the CHY formulae for tree-level amplitudes based on scattering equations. The loop extensions, as far as they've been tested, as we heard from Ricardo, also work. Um, and of course, they diverge in, in D equals 10, as you'd expect. The Einstein equations are the exact consistency conditions for this theory on a curved background. And in particular, there's an anomaly free ambitwister string on, on this particular curved background, ADS3 cross S3 cross the flat 4 manifold with NS flux. I should say that there's also a pure spinner version of the ambitwister string, which is, which is known and, and, and worked with in, in flat space. And it's been conjectured what it should be, but perhaps not completely tested yet for the pure spinner version of the ambitwister string on ADS5 cross S5. It would be wonderful if, if something like you know, this program could be pushed through for that. Um, <clears throat> the CFT correlation functions are straightforward to compute in any of these models, again, precisely because fundamentally the XXOP is trivial, well, or even more fundamentally because it's a field theory. But localization on whatever, whatever is supposed to mean by the ADS scattering equations, I've shown you where it, it, it's supposed to come from, is something I've still to understand. I expect it to be nice in, in Mellon space. Yes, it's pure supergravity in the bulk. Yes. yes. Yes, if you wish, although again, I, I, I mean, hope, which I haven't realized, the hope is that you can resum Feynman diagrams, all n particle Feynman diagrams, into some sort of scattering equation type expression of the type I've perhaps suggested. That's a good question. Yeah, um, yeah, that's something I should try to do with the Mellon space thing, of course. Wh whether that can be done before localizing on solutions to the scattering equations that I don't know, or, or whether, I mean, of course, there's a well-known and very simple prescription for how to do that directly if you have the Mellon amplitude. It would be a good test of this to see what happens if you try. Yeah, I agree. I imagine it goes, I mean, that's all the story about the moduli of, of you know, either this uh, well sheet complex structure or the, or, or the gauge field. I imagine that goes through in the same way. The, the key difference is, in flat space, we could understand what P squared was in terms of external data. Here, J squared, okay, perhaps writing it in terms of conformal blocks, uh, writing its action on conformal blocks is a good thing to do. But at the moment, I haven't been able to understand what, you know, what that is, except as an operator, either a CFT operator or a differential operator. Um, and so it doesn't make sense to say what is the delta function of a differential operator. <laughs>
I, I think it's... I think it's connected with, I mean, it's where you see the non-abelian nature of, of, of I, mean, I could have set up this whole story and said that I was con considering a group manifold which is just an abelian group. Okay? And then as, uh, instead of having the killing form, I would have had some bi metric on the group, so that would have just been flat space with the normal flat metric, and, and it all, would have all gone through the same. I think the, the remnant of the non-abelian nature of the group is, is hiding in the the non-commutativity of di.dj with di.dk or something like that. So maybe a late question, but it's still a particle that just the master's particle. Yes. Oh, sure, sure. The, the, the mass, so the supergravity on ADS3 cross S3 cross M4. So you sure, sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, these are going to be the easiest ones to, to start with, right? So. Actually, of course, I mean, since we're just talking about CFT2, if we've just got stress tensors, holomorphic or anti-holomorphic stress tensors in the boundary CFT2, they were, the endpoint correlation functions of those were computed long ago by Zamologikov. So it's, it's, you know, these really should be easy. <laughs>